Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to today's stream seminar. Today, we are very honored to have Professor Marco Pavani to give us a talk on towards safe data-driven autonomy. Uh, professor Marco Pavani is an associate professor at uh, Stanford in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics. He's the director of the Autonomous Systems Laboratory and co-director of the Center for Automotive Research at Stanford. He received a PhD degree in MIT from the uh, Aeronautics and Astronautics Department in 2010. His main research interests are in the development of methodologies for the analysis, design, and control of autonomous systems with an emphasis on the self-driving cars, aerospace vehicles, and future mobility systems. He is a recipient of a, num uh, a numerous of, uh, awards, including a Presidential Early Career Award for scientists and engineers from President Barack Obama, an Office of Naval Research Young Investigator Award, an NSF Career Award, and a NASA Early Career Faculty Award. He is serving and has served on the advisory board of a number of autonomous driving startups, both small and multi-million dollar uh, ones. He routinely consults for major companies and financial institutions on the topic of autonomous systems and is a venture partner for investments in AI-enabled robots. Hi, Professor Pavoni. Uh, uh, I think you can begin the talk if you are ready. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much for the very extensive uh, introduction. Let me. Can you see my? Um, yes. Right. Yeah. Good. Great. All right. So again, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm very pleased to share some of my uh, recent research results with all of you. Specifically in this talk, I will uh, discuss some of the key open research challenges that my groups at uh, Stanford and Nvidia are addressing in order to enable the widespread deployment of autonomous vehicles, and in particular, self-driving cars. The recurring theme of the presentation will be how to make an autonomy stack increasingly data-driven, that is based on AI techniques, while still retaining a strong notion of safety and interpretability. Now, my research is broadly in the, in the field of decision-making and planning algorithms for autonomous systems. A key application domain of my work is uh, space robotics, specifically as a research technologist at the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab before joining Stanford. I worked on optimizing the entry, descent, and landing of rovers on the surface of Mars. Currently, through a collaboration with uh, NASA Ames and uh, Marco Koski's group at uh, Stanford, we're working on designing and planning and decision making algorithms to grasp and manipulate. Uh, objects uh, in space. Here I show a short video of uh, some recent experiments we carry out on the International Space Station, where we tested a gecko-inspired gripper mounted on a free-flying uh, robot, which in this case is attaching itself to the walls of the International Space Station. But my other key application domain, and indeed the focus of my presentation today, is uh, represented by uh, ground autonomous vehicles, specifically self-driving cars. At Stanford, I direct the Center for Automotive Research at Stanford, or CARS. And in the center, we study a number of aspects related to level four autonomous driving, from vehicle control to perception to decision-making, all the way to the new mobility paradigms that this new technology enables. I'm also fortunate to lead uh, autonomous vehicle research at uh, NVIDIA, uh, NVIDIA is indeed one of the most uh, ambitious programs in the field of uh, vehicle autonomy, spanning both uh, hardware and software, uh, ranging from uh, advanced driver assistance systems to very high levels of uh, autonomy. In this context, the overarching goal of my research is to develop the next generation of uh, AV stacks, making them increasingly data driven. In particular, I focus on uh, three main research trusts. First, developing robust and uh, human-centered autonomy algorithms, which can robustly reason about uh, complex interactions with other human agents on the roads for the purposes of both real-time decision-making and uh, safety. Second, developing methods for, for providing both uh, offline and online safety assurances for those components in an AV stack that uh, uh, are uh, learning based. And finally, developing data-driven 
yet modular autonomy stacks, which combine the flexibility of modular architectures with the efficiency of end-to-end -end data driven architectures. Of course, some of the research in each of these trusts is also relevant to the aerospace field. Of course, there are important differences. For example, obviously in space, in general, we do not, we do not have to deal with humans, but we do have other complexities, of course. In the remainder of this talk, I'll provide more details about my current planned research work in each of these three research trusts, starting with the topic of human-centered robust autonomy. Safely, safely and efficiently uh, dealing with the human agents on the road is indeed one of the key challenges for vehicle autonomy, as most of you, I'm sure, are already very well aware. This video shows, for example, the very complex and uh, oftentimes aggressive interactions that uh, arise when driving in my home country in Italy. This video is taken from Naples in particular. Importantly, this video showcases how interactions on the road are really an exercise in negotiation. And uh, autonomous vehicles should be able to perform such negotiations for safe and efficient driving. Specifically, autonomous vehicles should be able to perform interaction-aware decision-making, which refer to the capability of proactively interacting with other human agents on the road in order to uh, infer their intents, while concurrently exploiting this information to take actions that account for possible agent responses. A key first step to enable interaction-aware decision-making is to develop models for intent prediction and uh, trajectory forecasting, basically to reason about what other agents on the road will do in the future, say in the next uh, three to five seconds. In our work, we have uh, embraced a phenomenological approach, whereby we learn the relative likelihoods uh, of human actions and uh, responses without making any structural assumptions on how humans are doing their own reasoning. Now, a particular uh, class of phenomenological models is uh, represented by generative models, whereby we want to learn a distribution P about the future human, human, human actions denoted by U sub H of T plus one. Sub H here means uh, it refers to human quantities, Subscript R refers to uh, robot quantities, so the self-driving car. So we want to learn this uh, distribution P about uh, future human actions, conditional on the interaction history denoted by X and U and uh, highlighted in gray on this slide, as well as conditional on a candidate robot action sequence denoted by U sub R T plus one and uh, highlighted in uh, purple. The interaction history represents, for example, the history of relative poses between the autonomous vehicle and the other agents on the road. Here, T is the current time, T plus one is the next time step. Conditioning on the history lets you infer things about the human, such as a, a dry, a, you know, attentiveness and or alertness or aggressiveness while conditioning on the autonomous car's future lets us capture the interactive aspect of an interaction, because basically it lets us answer questions of the type, if in a, um, an interaction history, a robot were to enact a, a, cert a certain acceleration profile, what would be the distribution of possible human responses? Over the years, we have developed a fairly general generative model to forecast human trajectories, referred to as a trajectron plus plus. This framework is based on a conditional variation autoencoder model and can ingest as conditioning variables for the predictions a vast set of heterogeneous data. From dynamical information, of course, pedestrians move in a way that is different from the way that uh, cars or bikers move all the way to maps encoding information, such as road boundaries and uh, crosswalks. And even human silhouette in order to properly predict pedestrian movement. We have thoroughly tested the, the trajectron uh, plus plus in closed loop with the planning algorithms on a test vehicle at the Center for Automotive Research at Stanford. 
the robotic vehicle in the movie on the right is the one that has a red rooftop. The role of the human-driven vehicle is taken by a small RC car, which is remotely controlled by a student. The RC car is very small, and but you can see it in the, in the sense that it has a, a relatively large white dot on top of a mast. The reason why we have this white reflective material is to make sure that the RC car is visible from the lighters on board the autonomous car. And the reason why we use a, a race car is, in this experiment is that we want to stress test our algorithms in highly interactive situations, traffic weaving here. And clearly, we want to make sure that nobody gets injured in case of uh, a failure. So um, leveraging Trajectron++ as our base trajectory forecasting model, we're currently working on four main themes that are key to fully enable interaction-aware decision-making, namely building transferable models of human behavior, which can be readily transferred to other areas in the world. One of the key challenges in the AV domain these days is that of scalability. Yes, we can do quite a good job at training a neural net that allow us to forecast trajectories, say in San Francisco. The moment we take that model and then we use it, say in Rome, Naples, or I don't know, in Munich, the model wouldn't work well anymore. And if every time that you deploy your system in your city, you have to retrain your stack from scratch, that will be exceedingly expensive and time consuming. So we're looking at ways to infuse, for example, meta learning techniques in trajectory forecasting in order to train models that are most conducive to rapid adaptation into in new environments. Second, we're wo working on making such models robust to errors and uncertainties stemming from upstream perception components, for example, classification error. Third, we're develop, devising algorithms that tightly couple prediction and planning by fully exploiting the probabilistic predictions. And finally, we are developing simulators that can leverage such models to simulate the realistic uh, human motion in close loop with a simulated autonomous vehicle. And here in the interest of time, I will only provide some details on how to leverage human prediction models for the purposes of a simulation. Behavior modeling indeed uh, goes beyond prediction. It can inform us how to build a, a better simulator by allowing us to emulate humans in a realistic uh, way. And simulation in a way is the holy grail in the field of autonomous vehicles. But unfortunately simulators are used much less than uh, uh, you know, we would like to. Uh, indeed, in the past few decades, there has been a lot of progress in a simulation for uh, autonomous vehicles. Starting from the seminal car sim simulator in uh, 1990, we have seen uh, AV simulators with ultra realistic uh, sensors and physics simulations from say Virtual Kitty and Carla, among others. And recently the NVIDIA drive sim uh, simulator with a photorealistic rendering and integration within the broader uh, Omniverse ecosystem. However, we are still not ready to use these simulators to develop uh, to a large extent, uh, certainly not to validate the end-to-end -to -end, end -to -end performance of a driving stack. And arguably the key missing piece is that the behaviors of the simulated agents in most simulators that are available out there are still controlled by pre-programmed logic or or rather simple models. And so they don't really capture the nuanced and uh, uh, very diverse behavior that a real human would uh, enact. And to truly create a, a realistic driving simulation, we need to build intelligent agents that generate realistic human-like behaviors. This is a topic that we are actually working on in my group at NVIDIA. Specifically, we're developing machine learning-based behavior model to ground behavior synthesis in real-world driving logs. And our goal is to then develop, is then to deploy these learned models into the NVIDIA simulator drive sim in order to enable realistic and closed-loop simulations. Now, concretely, we have three key desiderata for simulation traffic models. 
First of all, fidelity. Can we synthesize agent group behaviors that resemble real world traffic? Diversity, can we generate a wide range of realistic traffic patterns? And controllability, can we steer the traffic model to generate a specific scenario? But we face a number of uh, technical research challenges. In particular, stability. We want to prevent the simulation from diverging out of reasonable behaviors. Long horizon simulations. Ideally, we want to run the simulations for minutes or even hours. With the horizon, it is definitely much longer than the training data horizon. And then adaptivity. In order to use the simulation to test the AB stacks in new environments, we want to be able to adapt the simulator to the new environment with little to no tuning. As mentioned previously, we have today a pretty good idea of how to model human driving behaviors for the purposes of real-time trajectory prediction. The question is, uh, can we just use a prediction model, say Trajectron Plus Plus or some other models from the state of the art to simulate interactive agents? And the answer is not quite. For example, the video on the left is, is a, shows a sample driving trajectory from a real world driving log. As shown on the video on the right, if we just follow the most likely trajectory generated by a prediction model, and then uh, you know, we drive a, a chunk of it, and then we uh, replan, again, following the new most likely trajectory generated by the prediction model, the agent quickly diverges from a normal driving behavior and stops in the middle of the road. And the fundamental reason behind this diversion, divergence lies in the prediction model errors that accumulate over time and eventually cause the machine learning model to diverge from states if it knows how to handle. It, and therefore, it ends into an auto distribution situation and the output becomes erratic. So, to address these limitations, we have developed a hierarchical decision making framework that disentangles the imitation problems of modeling high level intent and low level control. And essentially, we are emulating how we as a humans make decisions on the road. First, we decide where we want to go, and then we make low level control decisions in order to get there. So here in the left video, uh, the, uh, on the left, the high level planner learns to set goals by sampling from a spatial probability map, which is shown on the right. And then the goal conditional policy makes a low level control decisions to reach the target. The policies uses a, a vehicle kinematic model to generate a phys phys physically plausible motion. There are quite a few details here, but the key insight is that such a decoupling approach is key to achieve a stable simulations of a very long horizon, as it significantly simplifies the learning problem and thus enable uh, better generalization. With this framework, we can create diverse scenarios by controlling <coughs> within a scene. And the vision is that in this way, we can generate countless realistic traffic patterns, which can be readily parallelized and allow an autonomous AD uh, stack to accumulate an unprecedented amount of realistic driving experience. And we can also envision uh, uh, alternate uh, evolutions of the scene, enabling counterfactual, counterfactual reasoning. So basically starting a scene with the same initial conditions, since the simulator is indeed probabilistic, we can generate uh, many different variations on the same uh, scene. Now, what's next? The next step is to be able to make these uh, simulations controllable. That is to steer the simulations towards scenarios that are particularly useful for simulation and validation. For example, cut-in driving scenarios. Now, this is difficult primarily due to the opaque nature of neural networks. But the neural network's bias is that it allows us to uh, very realistically replicate what humans do. But then controlling these models then becomes a major challenge as opposed to, say, some pre programmed logic. Now, in order to address this challenge, we have recently developed a methodology that leverages differentiable logic to guide generated trajectories to meet rules defined using a particular type of logic referred to as a signal temporal logic. 
This provides a very convenient way to guide a data-driven data -driven traffic model towards behaviors that are realistically emulate a scenario with specific characteristics. For example, some of the vehicles not yielding to the autonomous car or some of the pedestrians not crossing on the crosswalks and so on and so forth. Uh, here are some examples. On the left, we specify uh, logical rules that enforce a maximum speed limit for all agents, while on the right, we enforce that all agents stay sufficiently far apart from each other. So the takeaway message is that a closed loop simulation will play an increasingly major role in uh, AV development and verification and validation, certainly much more than uh, uh, what we currently do today. And the data-driven human modeling is a key enabling capability. From my point of view, probably one of the largest, if not the largest gap in, in order to really enable simulation at the scale. Other challenges, of course, include the photorealistic rendering of the scene and, uh, um, for example, uh, physics simulation of a vehicle, or even though for autonomous cars, that's pretty simple. Now, machine learning models are clearly ubiquitous in modern autonomous tasks, enabling a range of tasks from uh, perception to predictions, as we have just discussed. However, providing safety assurances for sub models, such models represent a major challenge, due in part to their you know, dynamic, non-deterministic behavior. And indeed, there are some cases where we know that a machine learning solution will work better, but we can't really use it because we are unable to provide the enough safety assurances for it. Case in point, for example, is the sensor fusion. We know that a, a deep learned sensor fusion strategy can perform much better than a classic, that the classical counterpart. But if you're pursuing safety certification, as for example, the case of uh, NVIDIA, then it becomes very really hard to make a, a, a safety certification case since that module represents uh, a single point of failure. Now, accordingly, a key thrust in my research is to devise techniques to endow autonomous stacks, and in particular, their learning-based components with the different types of safety assurances. There is no silver bullet. You need a plethora of tools. So first, we are developing on techniques to robustly train machine learning models, along with the safety KPIs that allow us to measure the safety of a module at scale. Second, we are designing tools to monitor learning-based components online, that is at runtime, in order to detect, detect and identify possible anomalies and uh, trigger early warnings. And finally, we are working on devising algorithmic modules referred to as a safety filters, whose goal is to bound online the behavior of learning-based components in order to enforce safety by design. And this is actually quite common in the AV industry. For example, NVIDIA has a concept referred to as a safety force field, Mobili has RSS, other companies have other concepts. Of course, the question is, how do we uh, reason uh, in the safety filters about the behavior of other agents in order to avoid over-conservatism? Over now, in the interest of time, I will only focus on the second topic, that is the topic of devising runtime monitors. Now, I'm sure that uh, all of you are already quite familiar with uh, how the typical uh, machine learning pipeline works, but just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Now, the typical process to develop an AI model includes exposing uh, the model to several examples of input-output pairs. Uh, that is to situations for which the correct answer is uh, known and is provided to the model for learning purposes. And here I show an example for the task of image segmentation. The hope is that once the model is trained, it will generalize well to new inputs. And this approach typically works extremely well. And this is the reason why machine learning models are at the core of modern AV stats. But providing safety assurances for such models, as I said, represents a major challenge, as they actually might fail in quite erratic ways. Here is an interesting example of a picture of a stop sign that is highlighted through a white uh, circle. So this is a picture of a stop sign on a billboard, which fools the perception system of the Tesla autopilot and causes a ghost break. It is a braking maneuver 
uh, without realism. And actually, Nizza has opened an investigation about uh, quantum breaks or ghost breaks by Tesla. And there is nothing particularly wrong with Tesla. Actually, uh, automated emerging system is a very difficult uh, uh, um, driver system systems to tune uh, because they're prone to all these kind of uh, uh, auto distribution events. More broadly, no matter how well a machine learning model is trained and optimized, it can still be perform poorly as it might encounter uh, situations that are very different from those encountered during training. Concretely, uh, consider the setting where an autonomous aircraft, in this case, is tasked with the tracking the center line of a runway. And consider a perception deep neural network, which translates a high dimensional visual observations uh, into an estimate of the state of the system. In this case, uh, lateral displacement between the aircraft and the center line of the runway. Then this uh, lateral displacement error is uh, used by controller, a standard PID controller, if you will, to produce an action to take in order to track the center line. Let's part and assume the deep neural network is trained on images representing clear lighting conditions. Now, when environment changes, for example, we're operating at night, the observation might be quite different from those seen in training. That is, there might be out of distribution. And the difference can lead to faults in uh, perception, for example, an erroneous estimate of lateral displacement, and this can negatively impact the closed loop behavior of the system. So to enable safe, trusted deployment of these learned models, it's critical we can detect and isolate these faults at uh, runtime, that is online. And with this goal in mind, the question is how we can equip pre-trained deep neural networks with monitors that can provide an anomaly signal warning us about auto-distribution events during operation, that is at runtime. Now, to address this question, the first one needs to rigorously define the notion of auto-distribution. At a high level, I think all of us are clear about what auto-distribution means, but quantifying this notion actually is trickier than uh, what you might see. Now, perhaps the most intuitive definition of auto-distribution is in terms of uh, distances in the input space. An input, such as an image, is a uh, team auto-distribution if it is far enough from the input seen at the training time, as in the example on the right on this slide. While this definition is intuitive, it does present challenges. First of all, it is hard to define a meaningful and tractable notion of distance on hard to define manifolds, such as the space of real world images. And practically, this approach requires storing training data at test time uh, in order to carry out the comparisons, which might be prohibitive from a memory storage standpoint. And fundamentally, this is a strategy that does not scale. A reasonable alternative entails learning a parametric model of the training distribution, leveraging advances in generative uh, modeling. However, these approaches are typically not suited for evaluating correlated sequences of inputs that a deep neural network in an autonomous stack is likely to see at uh, test time. The correlation comes from the natural evolution of a scene. Most importantly, these approaches are inherently disconnected from the prediction task. Since they only consider uh, the input and not how changes in input would change the model's predictions, which ultimate, which is ultimately what we care, as we are interested in a closed loop performance for uh, the system. To test the shortcomings, our insight is to embrace the notion of auto distribution from the perspective of a functional uncertainty. Specifically, we argue that an input is out of distribution uh, for you know, a given prediction task if the prediction for that input is not well determined by the training data. And this is appealing because it focuses on inputs that are different in a manner that could affect the underlying model's predictions. So this is cool, but the question is, how do we quantify this type of uncertainty? And to do so, we turn to Bayesian methods. And the typical approach requires three main steps. First, 
we define a prior of a functions mapping inputs to outputs. The figure on the right visualizes samples from such a prior on functions mapping a scalar input to a scalar output. This is just a, uh, a toy example. So all the curves here represent a prior over uh, uh, the functions mapping a, uh, scalar input to scalar output. Next, given the training data, we need to compute the posterior distribution over functions that are consistent with the training data, here shown with the gray dots. And we do so by leveraging a Bayes rule. And finally, give, given these uh, uh, posterior over functions, we can measure the remaining okay. uncertainty over the output at new test mm -hmm. input to classify inputs as in or out of the distribution. Uh, in the image on the right, for example, test inputs that are close to zero corresponds to regions where all models basically agree with each other. So basically the prediction is very well determined by the training data. And so we deem that point as in distribution. While for the points on the x-axis at, at, at about minus four and the two, there is a lot of disagreement between uh, the uh, functions, which basically means that uh, the model is not well determined by training data. And therefore we deem those points as out of distribution. So this example also better elucidate the concept of a functional uncertainty as I defined before. Now, translated to our context, this recipe entails first identifying a prior distribution over the space of functions, mapping from the potentially very high dimensional input space for the deep neural network to the output for a given prediction task. Second, devising methods to efficiently compute and represent the posterior over such a function class given training data. And finally, finding a way to compute the predictive uncertainty with low latency, which can then be used as an anomaly uh, signal. Our approach to do so is called a SCOD, or sketching curvature for auto distribution detection. SCOD is a model agnostic approach for equipping any pre-trained deep neural network with a measure of epistemic uncertainty. And SCOD applies the, uh, this Bayesian methodology by first constructing a prior by linearizing the trained neural network with respect to the weights, and then imposing a, a Gaussian prior on the deviation from the linearization point. This prior describes a wide range of nonlinear functions. We have a nonlinear function for each setting of the deviation weights delta W. And so these are all nonlinear functions that map from the input space to the output space of the neural network. And by construction include functions which fit well the training data, basically by setting delta W equal to zero. So working with the linearized model, as opposed to the nonlinear neural network directly, allows for analytic posterior inference. What I want to stress here is that this class of functions is still nonlinear in the input. So it's a highly representative set of priors of the functions. Now, the posterior over the weights for this linearized model is a Gaussian whose covariance is a function of the Hessian of the training loss with respect to the weights. And this is not too difficult to show. But yet, even for modestly sized networks, representing this high dimensional covariance matrix can still be intractable. So the key insight we leverage in SCAD is that for over-parameterized deep neural networks, this Hessian exhibit a rapid spectral decay. And, this, and thus we can achieve a substantial computational uh, efficiency gains by working with a low rank approximation. Specifically, we use a sketching-based uh, methodology to represent this posterior covariance in terms of uh, low-rank uh, uh, factors. At this time, we can obtain low-latency uncertainty predictions by analytically propagating the posterior Gaussian on the weights to the output of the linearized model, given a new test input. And finally, we can uh, compute a scalar measure of uh, uncertainty at runtime by evaluating the entropy of this predicted distribution, which can then be thresholded to detect uh, inputs as in or out of distributions, as per the functional uncertainty definition that I mentioned before. 
So let me show the application of this approach to the autonomous aircraft taxing example I mentioned before. As a reminder, the input to the neural network is the image of, uh, uh, of the runway, runway taken from a camera mounted on the wing, wing of the aircraft. And uh, um, we assume that the network has been trained in a, with clear morning, uh, in clear morning lighting conditions. The output of the system is then uh, um, the, the control for the front wheel of the aircraft in order to track the center line of the runway. Now in the simulation I'm about uh, uh, to show, we first run the runtime monitor on images, images similar to those taken during training, that is in clear morning conditions. And then we'll change the images more and more to auto distribution images, for example, from uh, afternoon conditions and uh, evening conditions. On the right hand side, I will, plot, I will plot the output of the runtime monitor as a function of time. I will also mark any time the network makes a significant estimation error with an X. We see that, uh, let me stop here. We see that uh, when deployed on a nominal conditions similar to the training conditions, then the network doesn't make mistakes and the Scott uncertainty value stays low. But as you switch to different lighting conditions, so afternoon conditions here, which were not included in the training data, we start seeing uh, shadows. Oops. Let me stop here. And these shadows cause large errors in the estimates of lateral displacement. But fortunately, this situation is uh, picked up by the monitor whose output, as you can see, is substantially higher than in the nominal case. That is, at least we know that the system is operating in a dangerous situation. Of course, you might ask, why didn't you include the images from the afternoon or from the evening as part of the training data set? Of course you would. This is just a toy example. But the point here is that uh, no matter how much uh, care you put in uh, optimizing your training data set, you're all, always going to have situations in real life that are out of distribution. And, uh, it, and it seems that Scott that does a good job in picking up those uh, uh, situations. We have uh, more quantitatively carried out uh, uh, comparisons with a number of baselines that you can find in a paper we published last year at uh, UAI. And we showed that Scott uh, essentially uh, outperforms all baselines from a suite of regression and uh, classification tasks. Uh, equally importantly, Scott runs extremely uh, fast. It takes about uh, two to three milliseconds uh, per uh, test input query, which is really compatible with uh, what you want from a runtime monitor. A runtime monitor represents extra overhead for your primary algorithmic pipeline. So typically the amount of compute that is reserved to it is extremely, extremely small. That's why you want to have runtime monitors that are extremely lightweight and run extremely uh, fast. Now, beyond runtime monitoring, these ideas can also be used to improve the long-term reliability of data-driven models, which I think is a problem of uh, uh, critical importance, especially now that we are uh, fielding this system uh, uh, as a product in real life. Specifically, as a case study in collaboration with the Aerospace Corporation, we're considering an application of a deep neural network trained to estimate the pose of a satellite from an input image. When this model is deployed, it is likely to experience auto-distribution inputs. This could be tail events that weren't captured in the original data set, such as lens flares. Reliable performance means that we can uh, uh, flag these uh, auto-distribution samples and we apply Scott to this setting and it works well. But more than just detecting, detecting auto-distribution inputs, it's important we can close the loop by collecting unfamiliar samples to level and to use them to retrain and improve the model. But this opens a new problem setting. Can we ensure good model performance while minimizing the cost of data storage and leveling? It is complicated task as we need to store inputs that are unfamiliar but also avoiding redundancy in order to um, you know, minimize storage cost and uh, communication bandwidth. To this purpose, we have developed an extension to SCOD that clusters inputs for diversity. And I'll skip the technical details here in the interest of time and only present our results. 
And in the plot, we see that our method, which entails flagging diverse images, outperforms other benchmarks, such as always flagging, never flagging, randomly flagging, and flagging based on pre-specified score thresholds. Specifically, our clustering algorithm, seen in the bottom right, achieves close to optimal uh, performance with a lower, lower, lower leveling costs compared to the benchmarks. So summing up, the key takeaway is that runtime monitors are key to build a high confidence machine learning systems by keeping the machine learning models constantly in check. And this I think is a crucial important area for future research, specific in particular for safety critical uh, autonomous vehicles. I'm currently investigating a number of directions related to runtime monitoring, including statistical methods to quantify the reliability of a given monitor in terms of its false positive and false negative uh, rates. For example, leveraging techniques from a conformal prediction. Second, techniques to classify the anomalies in a task relevant uh, fashion in order to better inform downstream decision making. Third, we're exploring ways to provide a causal explanations underlying an anomaly detection event in order to get more insights about why something is not working. Uh, as mentioned, we are working on uh, leveraging the time monitoring ideas for the purposes of data lifecycle management. We uh, are investigating methods to optimize the performance of AV stacks with the runtime monitors in the loop in order to optimize how and when, if the anomaly signal is high enough, we should revert, say, to a contingency maneuver or uh, some other fields, uh, other safety preserving uh, maneuver. And finally, we're investigating the application of SCADA to other settings, for example, uncertainty aware of flying enforcement learning. Now, in a few minutes, oh, actually, before switching to the next topic, if you're interested in this topic, we have recently published a review paper where we provide a broad categorization of auto distribution problems in robotics, and where we also discuss a number of open research questions. So, as I was saying in the last few minutes of this talk, I will talk a little bit about my architecting work that I'm quite excited about. Specifically, an assumption that has been more or less implicit so far is that we have been assuming a rigid modular architecture for an autonomy stack. For example, with a perception module driving the planning and control modules. And given this architecture, we have discussed different ways to improve the safety, performance, and so on. A natural question to ask is whether we can consider alternative architectures that are more conducive to save, uh, safe and high performance control. Specifically, the classical architecture for autonomous robots is highly modular, with key modules including detection, tracking, prediction, planning, control, mapping, localization, and so on and so forth. This is the typical structure that I teach my students at Stanford that most uh, uh, AV companies adopt. Key advantages of this architecture include interpretability and usability. However, this architecture introduces information of bottlenecks it might give rise to integration channels uh, challenges. So what happens is that this architecture, even organizationally, is mapped into different groups, a control group, a planning group, a prediction group that somewhat operate almost in isolation. And then when you try to integrate all of the models together, then it's a major challenge because you have a lot of unintended consequences due to the couplings. Before, at the, end, at the other end of the spectrum, we have end-to-end -end architectures that uh, have gained quite a bit of momentum in the past few years, which directly link perception to control, typically through a neural network, and only implicitly encode the key capabilities such as agent prediction. As key advantages, an end-to-end -end architecture removes information bottlenecks, and one could argue might achieve a level of optimality unattainable by modular architectures which are based on a rigid modular decomposition. However, among other things, it is very difficult to make any sort of a formal safety claim with such an architecture. So a natural question is whether we can get the best of both worlds in terms of architecture designs. And specifically, we're currently working on novel architectures that are still modular, but better align and integrate the different modules with respect to three key aspects. First, more expressive and learned representations of information flows on multiple levels of the AV stack. Second, metrics that capture upstream and downstream information flows, thereby coupling the design of different modules. For example, can 
planning aware metrics inform better perception and prediction algorithms. And finally, algorithmic approaches to co designing the different models by leveraging the aforementioned complete metrics and learned representations. So, let me provide more details about the last topic, uh, namely architectural co designs. As I've just argued, a key challenge with uh, modular AV stacks. Um, is that models are developed independently and, don't, and we don't have a good way to use data to improve the system directly as a whole. So there's this challenge while retaining the advantages of system modularity, we are developing modular yet end-to-end -end differentiable AV stacks that keep the main modules of a traditional AV stack and at the same time can be trained jointly from data. And the key idea is to implement existing uh, modules in a neural programming framework where all computation is expressed as a single differentiable computation graph. The differentiable representation allow us to back propagate gradients through both neural network components, as well as a fixed computational blocks, such as classical planning algorithms. And this way we can perform gradient-based learning end-to-end, -end, improving upstream modules directly for downstream tasks. Now, this is a little bit abstract. So to make ideas concrete, let's focus on the prediction and planning modules. This is an interesting setting given the importance of uh, these tasks, as well as the fact that this algorithmic pipeline comprises both data-driven components for prediction, for example, as well as uh, handcrafted algorithms for planning. And these algorithms typically are not differentiable, uh, at least. Uh, Specifically, we start with a fairly standard modular architecture. It has a deep prediction model, Trajectron++, which consumes past the tracklets for all traffic agents on the road and output probabilistic predictions about uh, if the future trajectories. These predictions are fed into a planner. In this case, a sampling-based algorithm that generates a set of candidate trajectories scores them with a handcrafted cost function and selects the candidate with the lowest cost. And the trajectory is then further optimized in optimization-based controller module, specifically an iterative L2 algorithm. So it's a very standard pipeline that you will find in many AV companies. Conventionally, the uh, modules are de developed independently. The prediction model is trained from uh, driving data to maximize uh, prediction accuracy, for example, final displacement error or average displacement error, where the planner and the controller are handcrafted, so basically manually tuned, for example, in terms of the cost functions. The key feature of our differentiable stack is that the planner and controller algorithms are differentiable. In the planner, we relax the admin operation with sampling. And in the controller, we use differentiable MPC from prior work. So during inference, diff stack, so this differentiable stack, behaves exactly the same as a standard stack. But what differentiability allow us to do is to use data at the end of the pipeline, but propagate losses through the control and planning algorithms and train the prediction model so that, for example, it focuses on making predictions that are critical for planning. We did experiments on the new scene dataset, and in each scenario, we plan a three-second open-loop control sequence given five seconds of observation history. We define training losses for each module, a standard variation of elbow loss for the prediction model, a cross-entropy loss for the planner, and a hindsight cost for the controller. The hindsight cost here measures the plan quality in hindsight. That is, after observing the future behavior of other agents, which we did not know at planning time. We consider, could consider also other type of costs, for example, an imitation cost. To characterize the benefits of this approach, we compare our differentiable architecture to a standard architecture where the prediction module is learned, but the other modules are manually tuned. And this is referred to as the standard modular stack. The table shows prediction performance in terms of the average displacement error and also displays average cost of uh, uh, the planned trajectories. To make planning costs interpretable, we present them relative to lower and upper bounds, corresponding to planning without accounting for predictions, in the case of the upper bound, or planning with ground truth prediction, which is not possible in practice 
that it thus it provides a lower bound on the achievable cost. We see that accounting for predictions with a standard model architecture, whereby modules are designed in isolation, achieves a 71% cost improvement with respect to the maximum achievable cost improvement. The maximum achievable cost improvement is the cost improvement that in theory could be achieved by a planner that has access to ground truth prediction, or in other words, can perfectly predict the future, which of course is not possible. This clearly shows that the trajectory predictions are indeed very useful for planning, which of course is not surprising and not really the point I want to make here. The point I want to make here is that a differentiable planner can achieve an 83% cost improvement with respect to the maximum achievable cost improvement. That is an additional 12% with respect to what the standard modular stack can deliver, which is quite sub substantial. And equally importantly, this is in addition to potentially drastically reducing development cost, in the sense that with a standard modular stack, a lot of time is spent on hand tuning all the cost functions, all the weights, and so on and so forth. So with differentiable stack, not only we gain basically automatic tuning and training, but also uh, performance improvement, so which is really great from the point of view of uh, uh, development. So we have more interesting results in a paper that we'll be presenting at uh, Corel. And going forward, we see a number of new opportunities that emerge from such a differentiable autonomy uh, architecture paradigm. For example, we could learn how to incorporate uncertainties into planning or learn how to handle occlusions. And eventually we could consider uh, training all components in the AV stack jointly. So summing up, the key takeaway message here is that uh, there is a full spectrum, spectrum of architectural opportunities between classic modular and end-to-end -end instantiations. They typically are presenting as, uh, uh, um, you know, in contrast to each other, but actually there is a whole gray area that is largely under, uh, unexplored of opportunities uh, for you know, research and development. We're investigating actually such opportunities through learned representations of information flows, design of task aware evaluation metrics, scaling up neural, the neural programming framework I presented to an increasingly large portion of the V stack. And we are also currently performing a, a closed loop training and evaluation of, of a full differentiable modular stack in Carla and uh, through new plan. With that, I will conclude here. I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Of course, I would like to acknowledge all the researchers, both in the group at Stanford at NVIDIA for their great work. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Marco. Yeah, thank you, Professor, for giving us this wonderful talk. I think we may have time for one or two questions from the audience. Um, yeah. Uh, is there any question from the audience to Professor Pavoni? Oh, I uh, see. Erdem. Um, yeah. Oh. Erdem, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so my question is about uh, out of distribution detection. Uh, so when you use uncertainty for that, like if the data set has already uncertainty for the labels, uh, like do we still count those samples as out of distribution or is it possible to still label them as in distribution but the labels are uh, uncertain? Yeah, that's an interesting question. No, currently we do not account for uncertainty in the labels. Uh, but that's an interesting question. How would you account that? And also a very practical question. Yeah. But for now, no, we don't account for that. Okay, thank you. There's a question in the chat. Um, <clears throat> Marco, I don't know if you can see the chat. Yeah, I'm opening it now. So first of all, oh, okay. So sorry, the question is: uh, uh, Does reinforcement learning play any role in the technology stack? If not, what do you think prevents it from performing well? So first of all, the uh, hindsight costs that I presented, in a way, can be interpreted as a sort of an enforcement signal. So actually, can be interpreted as an instantiation of uh, reinforcement learning. Of course. Um, Reinforcer learning, uh, fully fledged reinforcer learning for autonomous driving is uh, uh, difficult for a number of reasons. One of them being that we don't have yet a good simulator, as uh, I explained uh, uh, before. So there is the risk that uh, your um, you know, trained model might then overfit to the nuances of your uh, simulator. 
So that's why reinforcement learning is used in you know, very specific context in the specific you know, aspects of the decision making stack, but not as a whole because of particular deficiency, deficiency in uh, the simulator. For the differential stack I presented specifically, the hindsight cost actually can be uh, considered a sort of reinforcement learning uh, way of training the stack. Thank in you. general, if the equation is more about how much learning is used, of course, perception is all learning based. Sensor fusion, as I said, is uh, it depends a little bit on the level of autonomy and the company you talk to because of some of the safety considerations. Prediction is an interesting case. Until a few years ago, it was primarily based on analytical models, so basically non learning based models. But now, many of the companies and most of the companies know of use deep learning. Decision making and planning is still primarily based on optimization based techniques. That doesn't mean that machine learning is not important there, but it's typically used more, for example, to warm start uh, uh, optimizers or, for example, to accelerate uh, tree based uh, uh, search and so on and so forth, as opposed to overhauling the entire decision making and planning stack, which I think is the right thing to do, uh, honestly. Thanks very much for your answers. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much, Marco, for giving us this great talk and uh, kind of a glimpse into your overall program and um, an overview of that program and a glimpse into some of those projects. Uh, it was a real pleasure. And as you said, uh, next time we would love you to come up in person and uh, we can host you properly. Thank you very much. I look forward to it. And by the way, I'll be at Mars on Friday. So if you want to talk oh, to me. We'll see you there then. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Marco. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Ha happy Halloween. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.